Hey, this is Jennifer Tribe of Avic Networks. I'm the host of Avic's podcast, Frankly MSP, where we talk about how to boost productivity, efficiency, and profitability in your service provider business. But today, Avic is excited to be part of Tub Talk, and we have a special offer for you later in the show. Stay tuned. You're listening to Tub Talk, the podcast for IT business owners with our featured conversation with Richard Tubb and Mostyn Thomas of Asterix IT Support. My name is Jeff Nicholson, and this podcast is all about helping you grow your IT business. In this episode, Richard talks with Mostyn Thomas, founder of Asterix Pure Plan MSP. Mostyn started out providing managed service contracts to schools and local authorities. You'll hear about the challenges he faces working in an area with no large businesses and how to provide low-cost support that also protects the customer. This episode was recorded in person between Richard and Mostyn at the Network Group event in the UK. And now, without further ado, here's Richard Tubb talking to Mostyn. Hi everyone, Richard's here with an interview with Mostyn Thomas from uh, Welsh, Wales-based Asterix Systems. That's correct. <laughs> Tell us exactly where in Wales you are for the uh, uninitiated. We're, uh, we're located in a place called Abercunnan, which is about 10 miles north of uh, Cardiff on the A470 there. Okay. And give us a little bit of background on uh, where you've come from, how you've got to where you are, because you're running a managed service provider now, a pure plan managed service provider. Yes. And what brought you to that point? Uh, we started off with an education market, um, which in itself was, was a managed service, but uh, we would sell contracts to, to schools and local, uh, local authority, uh, providing a managed service to them. Um, then moving into, into businesses and uh, sort of break fix and sort of partial man- managed services. Um, we've now moved away from, from education, markets changed and so have we, uh, but we're moving uh, into businesses now in a full managed service uh, um, a play really, in the fact that we either charge a monthly or per user fee and then give them various levels of service depending on what they require. Okay. And talk me through the timeline there. So you said break fixed, you moved away. How long has the business been running? Um, uh, 15 years, actually. 15 years? Yeah, yeah. 15 years. And, and, and what did the evolution look like? When did you move from break fixed to managed services? Um, I've got to say, we, we're, we're unusual in the fact, I think we started in MSP 15 right. years ago um, and probably drifted into somewhat break fix, not a huge amount, but you know, a good proportion to get into that business market probably five years later, so 10 years ago. Um, and then... I guess because of our experience in education and uh, that MSP model uh, there, we, we recognised early people doing the MSP uh, play and, uh, and probably seven or eight years ago started to really focus on this is where we need to be, go back to where we started really, but in, yeah. in the business forum. So the last five years have been just total MSP basically. We've, we've got to that and, and just slowly honed down and, and not got rid of, but either engineered those customers to be MSPs or, or party company and left them uh, to, to another provider really. Yeah, and I know many of the uh, MSPs watching today will be interested if I ask you specifically about the tools and techniques that you use within the business. Sure. But before we go down that road, I'm intrigued. What's your definition of a managed service provider? How would you define an MSP? I know there's a, um, th- th- there's, there's a wide-ranging definition to that, isn't there? Um, and, and I think a lot of people have got different things. But for us, um, it means that uh, we charge a monthly fee and the customer and my, my uh, technicians understand what they're paying for and we deliver that rather than having to hit them with big bills or do you know you're going to have to pay for this or, or that sort of conversation which in the break fix world is where you're at. Um, so for us it's that. I know that pure MSP mainly is probably um, you know so much per user per month and, and we have got some of those clients and we would love to move entirely to that but our local our location and our client base still um, restricts us from doing that purely. I've got to be honest, that's where the, the utopia is. That's where we would like to be because it, it, it's clear for customers and clear for technicians and, and for planning of the business. Um, that's where to be. So, so I guess we're somewhat hybrid to a certain extent, um, but moving towards a full model and even exploring the fact of um, adding hardware into that as well. Yeah. So you get a, 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 one, a one fee and you get your hardware, you get everything, um, which would guarantee quality from end to end, really. 
And you mentioned um, things might be slightly different in your part of the world. How would you, you've got vast knowledge of how MSPs across the UK and Europe and worldwide indeed work. How would you define the Welsh market and what are the differences between where you are specifically in Wales and the rest of the UK? Um, I think that um, there's, there's a couple of differences. One being that um, the Welsh market is somewhat separated from the rest of the country. Obviously, we are, you know, it is joined, but but there is sort of a cultural uh, change there. So, although uh, Welsh companies will buy off, off off English, American, whatever companies, there is a there is a um, there's an appetite to buy from local people, yeah. which is across the UK, I realise, but it does seem quite strong. And I know the similar is due in, in Scotland as well. Um, so, so you've got that. And, and I think also um, South Wales, where we're located, um, is very much small business land. There's very little large industry there anymore. You haven't got huge employers. So um, th there do doesn't tend to be the sort of medium size um, employers who are working with those. It's very, very much small business and slightly bigger business. Um, so you have to tailor your offering to who's in your location yeah. or move location. Um, so whilst it's still quite profitable and, and, and everyone gets on you know, really well and there's, there's really good business to be done, it's a slightly different type. When I talk to some fellow MSPs from, say, the, the Thames Valley area or, or, or maybe Manchester, they've got four or five clients that, that, that pay them a lot of money and they, they, can, they can deal with them in that way, whereas we just haven't got that, that, that industry in our location. So you have to tailor your, your offering to that, really, and yeah. I think they're the main differences for us. Yeah. And how does that um, how does that change your mindset? So when you go out and learn from other people within the industry, how do you tailor that for your local market? Um, I guess we have to be careful when we're looking at equipment. People, people. Um, uh, sorry, pause. We have to be careful with equipment that sometimes um, you know, boardrooms, for instance, wherever might spend five or six thousand pounds on an interactive flat panel or something of that sort of thing, and a, a real high-end laptop to go with it. Um, they're, they're just not going to do that in our area. So there's no point putting all our eggs. We might, you know, sell the odd one, but we might not do that. And the same is due with the service, clearly. Um, if you're trying to sell something at the top end of that managed service provision and you're going into someone with 10 or 15 people, they're probably not likely to buy that. You need to tailor your services around that. Um, same is due for things like disaster recovery. Um, you know, there, there are obviously different levels of disaster recovery and, and, and you, re you know, how quickly you can return to operation. Um, and you might have to tailor that. You cannot always sell the Rolls Royce yes. to, to in that market. You know, you might have to compromise a little bit. They'll still see the value in, in disaster recovery and business continuity, but you need to be have a reality check a little bit, which doesn't mean it's any less profitable. It's just slightly different, really. Yeah. So let's dig a, dip, a bit deeper into Asterix Systems. Um, how many members of staff? You've already mentioned you've got um, 15 years of experience there, but how many members of staff? And if we can, let's talk a little bit about the tools that you use in the business as well. Okay. Um, we're, we're a small team. There's six of us. Um, uh, and, and it's very engineering-led. You know, I'm probably the sales resource and management and bottle washer and yep. everything else. Um, but I've got an amazing team of technicians um, who, who do a great job and look after the customers as well. They've all been brought up in that environment of customer service as well as technical. I don't need a business development manager. I've got five of them. Um, so that works really, really well. Um, and they pedal really hard. I pay them well, I think, for the local area. I try to pay them well. Um, and I expect a lot from them and they deliver it. And I think speaking to them, that's how... Uh, what they enjoy, they enjoy the challenge, and the and, and they know that, that you know it's not an everyday job. That they that they are challenged, and uh, and you know uh, we we rarely lose any staff, which I'm hoping is quite a good sign. Um, some of the tools that we use, we always use that to, to be efficient and to leverage our position. We might only have five technical staff, but I like to think they punch like they have 10 technical staff. Sure. Um, so we use um, a lot of monitoring and a lot of, um, a lot of uh, outsourced services. So we heavily use the continuum service. Um, which is a, is a, is a sort of end-to-end -end service, but the monitoring is, is excellent, so we get a very good visibility of problems as they happen or before they happen. Um, and, of course, we use their network operation, uh, outsource network operation centre, um, which, which basically means we've got access to 750 um, like-minded technicians 24-7. Um, all right, it's not 
a solution. You can't just operate in that way. You need bodies on the ground and you need people to answer the phone and be asterisks. Um, but I mean, it, it makes you much bigger. It doesn't even make you feel much bigger. It makes you actually bigger than you are. You yeah. can handle large jobs, complicated things you might only do once every six months. There are guys there who are doing them all the time. So I would say key to our operation is, is, is the continuum service. Um, and then a number of other uh, monitoring and other types of services. We monitor a lot of uh, a lot of things like uh, our wireless connections. We put a lot of wireless connections okay. in, and we use the Ubiquity service, yeah. um, and and that's easy to monitor. Many hundreds. Uh, we we host the monitoring in our own uh, servers in our data center, so we can have statistics on what's up, what's down, what's working, what needs updating. So these are all tools we use to to magnify the effect of five engineers to make them seem like ten engineers. Yeah. Um, what about a professional service automation tool? Do you use a PSA tool? Of course, yes, of course. We use Autotask, yeah. um, and we have ever since they came to the UK, I think in 2010. So so we we, we were sort of early adopters in the UK. Uh, uh, style of that, um, which was a deal through the network group, um, very attractive deal. But um, we find their their um, their service very good, very comprehensive. I probably don't use every single thing of it, but probably use seventy five percent of of the product. Yeah. Um, and for me, being you know uh, the sole management bit of of, of the piece, um, it means I can get access to how efficient we are. How, how are we hitting our targets, our SLAs? You know, if I can respond quickly to customers and say, we've got this issue and send a global ticket out. Um, I can really see problems arising as the engineers are doing them. Um, it, it, it really, again, is, is a key part of our business. So Autotask and Continuum actually uh, integrates with it really well. Um, they generate their own tickets on that system so I can see how efficient they're being against us as well. So, so yeah, another key factor in our business, really. Yeah, and you mentioned Network Group there. I'd like to talk about Network Group and your peer collaboration at Asterix as a whole in a minute. But something you said really intrigued me there when I asked you if you got a PSA tool. You said, of course, as though it would be crazy enough not to have a PSA tool. For anybody um, watching or listening in today, um, MSP or an IT solution provider, who doesn't use a PSA tool, why do you say, of course, they should go down that road? Um, well, yeah, I suppose that's a, that's a very good observation. Um, I, I think I would, uh, I would find it difficult to keep a handle on all the different flows and feeds of information and... And, and make sense of them. Yes, I think you could probably handle it through spreadsheets and, and, a, and a basic ticketing system. Yes, of course that's possible. Um, but I think today's customers, even though they may only be 10 or 15 people, they're demanding quality and, and information of what you're actually doing, which the, when they know that information, they're more than happy to pay your fee. But I think you need to demonstrate that. And with more remote, remote work, and uh, and sort of proactive fixing, um, you spend less time actually, you know, saying hello to people and fixing, uh, going under desks and things is, is one of the things of the past, really. Um, so you're not in their face as much. Yeah. So you need to be proving the points that you're doing. It's not necessarily a, a sort of um, a money play. It's more about, look, we are here and we're caring for you and we're looking after your system and reports yeah. sort of demonstrate that. Uh, these reports are easy to generate from a PSA tool uh, because it's got all the information coming in. You merely, merely need to select the boxes and, 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 and sort of alter the parameters as to what you want to display and, and it's there. So there are many other aspects to it, but I think the m most important is to make sense of all that information. And there is a huge amount of information there, you know, so, yeah. you know, from, from how much time an engineer is spending on something and how many, you know, someone wants requests for, for, for a quote for something, everything we feed into it so I can see how efficient I've been and how efficient my engineers have been. Makes sense. And uh, one of the things about a PSA system, you already touched upon it, information that it um, uh, can spit out basically for you, all depends on the information that you put in there in the first place. So I'll ask you just between you and I, because there's no one else around here. Of course. Moment, how good are your engineers are actually logging tickets, updating tickets and entering their time in the system? Um, I think I know what you're getting at, and I've had many conversations around this. Um, and I'm, I'm, I've got to be honest, I, I alluded earlier, they are a very good team of engineers and stroke business development people. So they realize we have many sessions, training sessions on how important it is. It's not, I'm not checking up on them. It's really important that they understand that by by recording everything, we understand whether, which customers are profitable and which aren't. And clearly, if we've got lots that aren't, 
you know, there's going to come a point where we can't pay the wages. So yeah. it's, it's, it's self-preservation to, to a lot of larger extent. And I try to impress that on them. I don't try. They get that. Yeah. Um, so I think, yes, um, some organizations have got a culture sometimes that they don't report everything yeah. or they over-report things. Um, I guess that's a culture thing. And I like to think we've instilled uh, the right culture. But... Um, you know, the job of the business owner or whoever is to sanitize those reports and make sense of them, I suppose. So, so yeah, you really have got to make, um, make sure that the information going in is clean. I guess garbage in, garbage out. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Really interesting insight there. And I think it uh, will be of interest to, uh, to a lot of people listening and watching this about the culture mm. of the business. Um, yeah. I speak to MSPs quite a lot. And the reason, and it, you knew what I was getting at there, the reason I asked that question about the information that goes in is so many MSPs that I come across really struggle to get their engineers to log time right. um, because the engineers just don't understand why yeah. they need to. They say, hey, I'm too busy fixing issues yeah. to log time. So it sounds as though you've nailed that, but and it sounds as though you've nailed it by um, letting the engineers know that their job isn't just to fix issues, it's they're part of the business as a whole and the time is needed to be logged to understand where you could be more profitable as a whole business. Um, I would agree, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very much uh, in, into uh, uh, instilling a very good business culture as well. And, and the engineers, I may not get it right all the time. In fact, I'm sure if they're watching this, they will, uh, they will probably agree. But I, I like to share the vision of the, of the whole business, where we'd like to go. I include where they'd like to go into, into our discussions as well. We regularly meet, not just team meeting, let's have a, you know, find out who's a pain and who's not. We have genuine strategy team meetings. Um, and, and I like to include them in the business strategy. So they're all bought into the whole exercise and as part of that as you just said they understand the importance of knowing who's paying our bills and who's not paying our bills yeah. um, and I believe I believe IT people are you know everyone likes to pigeonhole this but I think our IT people are now getting really quite business savvy and there are a lot of technicians out there who do understand this they've just never had a chance yeah absolutely now we touched upon um, the network group earlier on um, I've been a friend to the network group for, for a number of years really enjoy spending time um, with the network group um, You've been a member for how long now? Seven years this year. Seven years. Yes. I, remember, I, remember. I, I think you and I first met, I believe it was either through the network group or through CompTIA. One of the two. Uh, I can't one remember. of the two there. But uh, I, I guess the point is you're, um, you don't work in isolation. Um, you're big on peer collaboration and sharing knowledge with other IT companies. What do you get out of that? Aren't you giving away all your trade secrets to all the other IT companies out there? Um, I guess with any argument, you could look at it both ways, can't you? Um, but... Uh, I think when I go back to how my business is and quite a few other members are the same in the fact that, um, you know, we've got a lot of good staff, but we are, we, we, we take on the management and own a bit ourselves or, or sometimes some people have got two and that can be a very lonely role. And sometimes not only lonely, you, you sometimes struggle for some inspiration and ideas um, to join a group of similar minded people who have exactly the same problems as you and the same issues and may have a solution to one problem that you've got. And you might have a solution to those is, is basically, um, you know, inspirational, to be honest. Um, it, it, it just makes life so much easier. Um, why we share? I guess it's because it's based on experience. You know, you do it once and it's a great result. You're going to do it again. Um, um, so, so you see other people doing it when you first join the group and you're a little bit, a bit of trepidation going on there. Yes. Why would I tell these people what my golden egg is? Um, but you soon realize you give one golden egg away, you get six back. Yeah. Uh, and I think that is the key. Absolutely. I love it. Yeah. Where else do you look to for your inspiration, advice, motivation within the IT industry? How do you, how do you keep your soul sharp? How do you keep your mind sharp and, and learn about new things? Um, Staying with Network Group, I would say I pick up a lot there. They, yeah. they have a lot of great quality speakers. They engage yourself. So, so go to you guys. A lot of great quality speakers and me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, so, so, so we get a lot through there. Yeah. Obviously, other industry speakers like yourself. I've got a comp tier. You've obviously seen me there. And, and they, they hire a lot of great speakers too do, and that yeah. sort of thing. So I think you have to be careful not to spend too much time out of the office. But I think it's really important when you run a business um, that, uh, that you, you take direction and new ideas. So I think I, I book myself on probably three or four 
uh, key events per year that I know I'm going to get good quality from, and of course, probably five network group uh, a year. So that's probably nearly one per month, but it's essential business development time that you've got to invest to go forward. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you know, you can, particularly on your own, you can become stagnant very quickly. Definitely. Um, so there are definitely some key events, and I know on your website, you normally put a calendar of the really key events, yeah. and that, that, that's, that's really good because they're really important. Fantastic. Uh, are you a book reader? Do you read a lot of books or not? I do read quite a few, and 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 very fortunately, the the managing director of the group uh, is an avid book reader, so he's always got something to re- uh, to uh, to recommend for you. So uh, so I'm I'm, I'm clearly uh, I'm clearly always doing that. And what's the what was the latest book that you read that made an impression on you? Um, I think the latest book that I. Uh, um, that's made an impression on me was one I revisited, actually. Okay. I think it's one that I gave to Phil at some point, and he's probably not going to uh, believe me. But I redid it because I, uh, about six months ago, I gave a copy to all the staff, which was um, The Fred Factor. Ah, yes. Mark Sanborn? Mark Sanborn, yeah. which is a very simple book to read and what have you, but as, as usual, the simple things are the best. So I've read quite a lot, um, but, but gone back to that one, reread it and thought, I'm going to buy them all a copy. So I did, um, and, 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 and the, the, uh, the, the lessons are, are still true today. Yeah, yeah. So that's the Fred Factor by Mark Sandball. We'll include that in the uh, in the show notes as well for anybody who wants to get a hold of it. Do you listen to podcasts, visit blogs, things like that? Is there any that you'd, you'd pick out? Um, and I should say I'm not fishing here for uh, it. <laughs> so, I've uh, got to be honest, sometimes it's difficult to get enough time to do it, but yeah. clearly I, I listen to yours. That's fine. Um, and there's quite a few around that I, I search around. I'm struggling to remember them right now. I think, you know, um, there are quite a few signposted from MSP Mentor yeah. and a couple of other sites which you sort of end off, you know, uh, um, are sort of going off on a tangent and finding them. But so, yes, um, again, it's, it's valuable time for development of your business. So yeah. so I do, I do look at a few, but I'm going to be watching this one. <laughs> <laughs> Let's revisit tools for a moment. Something you said um, I, f- I found interesting. You talked specifically about disaster recovery. Right. Do you use, uh, and business continuity, do you use a specific tool for that or is it a hybrid? Is it something you built yourself? Or? Um, uh, we're all of the above, unfortunately, mm. at the moment. Uh, and I think that market is very much that way. Uh, we've held a couple of sessions here at Network Group around it and, and, and there were so many solutions. Yeah. I think we probably use three at the moment. Um, we're using, starting to use the continuum uh, uh, offering, which it seems to very, very good one backed by the Network Operations Centre, obviously. Um, and we use the Datto uh, uh, alternative as well, which again is a great piece of equipment, um, more high end. And again, I have to be careful going back to where we are in South Wales. Um, you have to tailor to what, to what people can afford. Uh, and we use our own one. We've got our own data centre. Well, you know, we've got our own racks in a data centre local to us. Um, so we built our own array and we use a piece of software called Assay. To, yep, to back up to, it, yeah. to back up to that, and, um, and and it's a good price point for some of our smaller customers. At least they get some DR at a reasonable price, yeah. um, and we're constantly reviewing because things change all the time, and people's expectations change all the time. So, yeah. so I think they're the three things that we pro- that we use, but you know we're on constantly trying to improve that. Yeah, big fan of Asa and stuff. I think it can be a um, difficult tool to manage, but we used to use it way yes. back in the day with my MSP for very um, um, rudimentary, dare I say, um, yeah. uh, sort of backup and disaster recovery. The market has certainly moved on with your data and your continuum and things like that. But again, you make an interesting point about um, it's what the market will bear and what mm. the local market will bear. So yeah. if people don't see the value in it, they're not going to go ahead with it. So. Yes, and, 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 and I think I'd, I'd rather give them something than yes. nothing. You know, I, I yeah. mean, we see so many infections, crypto infections, you know, rather than just you know, fire and flood, you know, they, they tend to be much more, um, much more relevant nowadays. So you, you need to give them something. You yeah. need to give them something. Yeah. Um, and, and you're right, it's not quite as comprehensive, but at least it works. Exactly, something. Uh, just off a tangent, uh, Crypto Locker, have you uh, had any clients who have been affected by that? How have you, have you helped them out of that? quite frankly, horrible situation? Uh, unfortunately, yes, we've had many. Um, we, uh, the direction of our company is heading, you know, headlong towards security and, 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 uh, and, and sort of preventing that and, and hopefully recovering people from it. Um, but yes, many, many. I, I can't think of the number off the top of my head for 2016, but I can tell you how many are in the last three weeks of December, and that was two. So, um, you know, one was a laptop, which was fairly important, and another one was a server, a whole system. Um, And and 
it's not easy. It's not easy. And it's a difficult thing to manage those customers as well because they're at a point of extreme stress. Yeah. Um, so you have to, be, you know, you have to really get your kid gloves on. You really want to say, I told you so, you're not taking provide. So you must find it incredibly frustrating, though, to give advice and then to see it. Yeah. It is, it is, and I think people watching will probably, re you know, echo that. You yeah. know, they will say, you know, I told you this would happen or you didn't spend the money and I did tell you and what have you. But y you have to be sort of magnanimous about it and, yeah. and think, right, okay, this is how we're going to go around fixing it. It's going to cost you a bit of money, but this is how it is. Um, and a couple of our, our, our clients in the past have then turned into our best evangelists, really. Yes. Uh, once yeah. you've recovered them and they've done it, they, 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 you could wheel them out in front of anyone and they will tell you how to do it. So people are very appreciative as well. So, so that's quite a rewarding aspect for our engineers in the fact that you basically a rescue in someone's business yeah. um, and they quite like that the engineers quite like that and obviously customers tend not to shout and scream they're really appreciative as well which everyone is happy with obviously so so yes the numbers are vastly on the increase I wish I could tell you how many there were lots but two in the last three weeks of, of December tells it all really and that's pretty consistent throughout the throughout the year um, we've had everything from um, actual people uh, remoted into the box manually uh, to many of the automated crypto locker attacks, um, advanced persistent threats, you name it, we've seen it. Um, we've had people pay the ransom and not pay the ransom. We've had people have uh, phishing attacks and paid £22,000 in, in, uh, from their bank. They did get some back, but, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have uh, been extremely happy about that. So, again, we've now started to move into education. You know, um, start to go around saying, you know, teaching some staff what to look for in a phishing email because obviously notoriously difficult to defend against. Um, but if we can, uh, if we can educate to a certain extent, like you never take someone, you never pay something just based on an email. First of all, end of end of sports, really. Um, so, so some basic security training can help a lot, you know. And and I find that quite rewarding. It's quite a nice. It's a new thing yeah. to talk about in IT, and it's different, you know, rather than just trying to keep the email server up. Yeah. Going back to something you said earlier, Mostyn, about um, uh, customers who have been through that pain um, then become evangelists and you know almost sell, sell you to other people. Um, what do you do in terms of marketing, apart from referrals, apart from word of mouth, which clearly you get a lot of business through, you're good at what you do, people talk about you to, to others and recommend you. What do you do to proactively go out and find new business people who don't know about Asterix Systems? I think we've tried a lot of, uh, you know, we've tried the flyers, we've tried all these things for various products and, and, and not really worked particularly well. And that's probably because we're probably not the best at marketing. But we put most of our eggs in the basket, uh, in the way of social media now. So, yeah. so we do, we create, we've got a blog site, we create lots of social media bits. I try to write a bit and I've got, I've got someone who does it for me. Um, so we find that generates a nice amount of, of, of action to our to our website and, and to our contacts and stuff so so i think that's really good and the the other area that particularly with security um people uh, like to really talk in depth about it i think they like to they like to really discuss that with you um, and we've put on a series of events um you know where people can come along and uh, increasingly now we're going to do some co-events with our accountant uh, practice oh, yeah. so because people quite often will come and talk about you know that maybe they're they're, they're um moving to a cloud-based accountancy system, but also they might think, yes, security is, is something I need to think about there. And, and you've sort of got two, you know, they've they, they got two birds of one stone and they'll, they'll make that journey. And, and quite often they will go to an accountant's practice, not an IT, uh, an IT uh, reseller. So, yeah. so partnering up, actually, we find quite, qu works quite well. And, and we're, we're really trying to ramp that system up a little bit because we've had great success from it. Yeah, yeah. So as we wind down our conversation today, um, I want to throw this question at you. And actually, I want to throw this question back at you. Right. You originally asked me this question, and I thought it's fascinating. If you were to start Asterix again tomorrow, or if you were to start your own MSP business tomorrow, what would you do differently? Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I never came up with it. That's why it's a good question. Um, I, I, I really think, based on where we are, uh, where we are located, I think I would probably almost definitely go cloud and cloud security only. Right. Uh, I wouldn't have anyone on the ground. I would be remote only and, and deal in that area if I was starting today. Um, I think there's huge potential in that area. Um, and you can work alongside current ISPs, uh, um, current uh, providers and internal departments without any threat. So I would think marketing would be a lot easier. Yeah. Um, and you'd have quite a, a very clear way 
of where you're going and what you're achieving. You know, I can't criticise anyone who's doing anything else. I am. I'm doing all those bits and, and, and along the way. But you asked me the question of where I would start today, and that's where I would start, I think. Interesting, interesting. And, and what's in the future for actual Asterix? So you're not going to reboot Asterix and do it, but what's in the future for Asterix over the next, say, uh, 18 months, three years? Um, we, Like I said, you know, security is our number one focus yeah. now. So so we are really gathering uh, certifications and more, more, more training and, 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 uh, and various uh, other things, you know, we we become a certification body for the cyber essential standard, um, which is gathering pace and really becoming a, a, a good a good uh, badge for for any business to prove that they've done at least some work in that area. So we're doing a lot there. Um, we're, we, we've, we've moved into, into internet provision as well. Uh, we're part of the London Internet Exchange and uh, RIPE. So, so we're, we, we, it's an area we never thought we would get into. We fell into it somewhat by accident. Um, but with uh, software-defined networking, it sort of goes in hand with security. Um, and I see us in going in that area um, because there's a huge amount of growth in that area. Yeah. Um, so I see that's where hopefully in three years we're the, we're the best in Wales at that. Well, we'll revisit this video and this podcast in three years' time and see where you are with it. So, Definitely. Uh, just before we go, I uh, during these interviews, I try to ask the questions that I think the audience, um, uh, my audience out there, MSPs, will want to know. Uh, don't always hit the mark, so there's bound to be some questions that people want to ask. How would people get in touch with you online, social media? You mentioned you're very active on. How can people reach out to you with any further questions they've got? I'm always happy to answer emails, honestly. Uh, so mostin.thomas at asterix.co.uk. You may regret that at this rate, but uh, let's see. <laughs> Not bothered. Um, or um, we're on, uh, I'm on LinkedIn at Asterix Systems um, and the same for Facebook. Um, so, so we're on there and um, on our website, www.asterix.co.uk. And we've got a blog on there and we'll have you. So if any people want to uh, make any comments, by all means, um, I guess probably LinkedIn is the best way. So at Asterix Systems. Fantastic. Well, I really appreciate you spending the time to me. So glad to, glad to finally sit down with you. I've known you for such a long time, been a fan of the work that you're doing down there in Thank Wales. You. And um, all the very best for su success for the future. Uh, really appreciate your time today. No, well, thanks for asking. Thanks a lot. Cheers, Cheers. then. Bye. Thanks for listening to Tub Talk, the podcast for IT business owners. You can find the show notes and bonus content for this interview, along with dozens of other interviews with IT business leaders over at www.tubblog.co.uk. If you enjoyed this podcast, then we'd really appreciate you rating and reviewing the show over at iTunes. Every review helps us reach new listeners and helps raise the bar for success in the IT industry. Thanks for listening, and I'll speak with you next episode. Have a great day. Hey, it's Jennifer Tribe from Avic, back to tell you about that special offer. First, what is Avic? Avic is network management for MSPs. Our cloud-based software gives you full visibility and control of network infrastructure, things like your client switches, routers, firewalls, and access points. Integrate it with an endpoint RMM system and you have complete control of a client's IT environment. With features like real-time network mapping and inventory, automated network monitoring that works right out of the box, and automated config backup and restore, Avic is the most efficient and profitable way for MSPs to manage network infrastructure. But don't just take my word for it. This is what Martin Hines of BCS has to say about us. He's one of our MSP partners in the UK. The biggest cost to any business is a staff, and for us, the engineering resource. So we want to make sure that for every hour we're spending supporting a client, we're getting the most out of it. All because a tool has saved us so much in terms of engineering resource that we are a more profitable organization. Want to know more? Sign up for a free demo at avic.com slash tubtalk. And when you subscribe, your first month is free. That's right, one month free on any Avic subscription if you sign up for a free demo using the link avic.com slash tubtalk. That's A-U-V as in Victor, I-K. This offer expires November 30th, 2018, so don't wait. Go to avic.com slash tubtalk today and sign up for your demo.